it's also a very good landmark for thinking about pacing strategies. Before I talk about pacing, something else just to, just to um, raise your awareness of. When we do these trials, the three minute, the seven minute, and the 12 minute trial, in, in this case, on this graph, we've actually got four performances. And I've said that the, the asymptote brings you down to critical power. But what is interesting is all of this work here, underneath the curve, has to be done anaerobically. So the critical power is an aerobic measure. It measures how much um, your, your ability to bring in oxygen and produce energy in that way. But as you know, at the beginning of the three minute trial that you did, you haven't got time to get that oxygen in, there's always a delay, so you have to do that work anaerobically. So for the three minute trial, there'd be a lot more anaerobic work in than say for the 12 minute trial. So what we can do is, we can use this data here to not only get your critical power, but we can look at um, all the work that you've done above and beyond your critical power to get an anaerobic estimate. So it's a great test. You can actually assess both aerobic and anaerobic ability in one series of tests, which no other lab test can really do. Some of you have seen this graph before. Um, so 10 mile time trial um, trace with lots of roundabouts. The power's dropped off. Um, but you can see after each roundabout, this athlete here has accelerated to get the speed up and then settle back into their uh, rhythm. But you can see the, the average power here, just over 400 watts. This is approximately this athlete's critical power. When we're working above critical power, according to the theory of the power-time relationship I showed you, all of that work is anaerobic. So over a 10 mile time trial, there'll be periods of time where you work above critical power, and then you come below it, so you restore a little bit of your anaerobic capacity. Next time, you start off again, you burn a little bit of your anaerobic work capacity, and then you recover a little bit. So this is why a 10 mile time trial, you don't necessarily sit at your critical power. You'll have periods of time where you can exhaust some of your anaerobic capacity to make you go faster. So the key is really is learning which athlete or what an athlete's total um, anaerobic. Uh, if you think of it a bit like a bath, if you think of it like a bath full of, of energy, that's your anaerobic work capacity. The rate that the water goes in and comes out from the tap and from the plug is your critical power. It's the ability to restore that level of water. So each time you go above your critical power, you're draining a little bit of the bath out. Each time you come below your critical power, you're filling it back up again. So you're kind of draining, refilling, draining throughout the race. Key is, by the end of the race, you want your bath time to be completely empty. If you want to have emptied everything out. So if you add up that anaerobic portion over the course of the race, you would get a little bit like this. But as you can see, the roundabouts, the slight downhills maybe, gives you a chance to just restore a little bit. So what we can do, now we're going to get your anaerobic work capacity from the, the trials you're doing today, we can estimate how much and when you can use that over different courses. The advances of technology now have, have meant that we can not only do this in the laboratory, but we can get you out on the road. Um, various systems, I'm obviously more familiar with the SRM. Um, Ergomo, we don't necessarily have to talk about much anymore, because uh, uh, they're not doing too well financially. But I think the power tap really is, um, I think it's becoming a stronger opponent now, a competitor of, of SRM. I think this system has a lot going for it. It's something, it's something that I want to, to learn a little bit more about. But the things, the things about all of these systems have, have in common is that you've got some kind of power meter in the SRM, it's in the chain set itself. You've got some kind of head unit to pick it up. And nowadays with the wireless systems, you don't even have to have this ugly cable that goes down on the bottom of the... Um, in fact, you can just see here, the cable's come a bit loose, so I don't know how many seconds that Lance lost them. Um, and then you can obviously download that to, to, to a PC later. I thought 
this would be an interesting file to, to show you. This is my first three K pursuit at the National Track Championships three three years ago now, 2005. Um, the, the green line is your power. So you can see at the beginning of the race, I was. Um, It's actually very similar to the three-minute trial we did, did this morning in terms of this is what a lot of the power profile efforts will look like. The difference on the track is, remember, I've got to get up to speed. And it's beneficial for me to burn off a little bit more of my anaerobic work capacity earlier on to get my bike from zero to the average race desired speed. So, high power put in. in. Interesting little blip here. I'll, I'll tell you that story at a, at a later time. Um, but you can see here, power output is not smooth on the track. Because every time you go around the banking, you have more power. It's all to do with the centripetal uh, forces. So you hit the bank and you kind of get slung out of the bend and your power drops because you're on a fixed gear. So you can see the fluctuations in cadence and speed and, and power as well. So it's not a smooth profile, but you can certainly see by the end I'm sustaining about 290 watts. And my average power for the whole ride was about 310 for four minute effort. What, we've, what we can do from this is, when you've got things like SRM, power measuring technology to, uh, to work with the, the, the rider out on the road or on the track, you, we can actually plot our critical power from the performance times as well. So here's the first point here. Um, this was a, that's the power output from my <coughs> last National Track Champs performance. I've gone, gone up a little bit by then, by about 15, 20 watts. At 3.30, I think I held for the 3 minutes, 50 something. Um, and then there's a 10 mile time trial, <coughs> just over up to 55, 260. And then an hour power. And you've got a very similar curve to the one we saw earlier from the shorter blocks. So actually, there might not be a need for you to do a lab testing session at all. You can take performance times to. Um, predict your critical power. Here it's coming out to 32. I mentioned that you can do trials out on the road and here we are doing a three minute, a five minute and a five <coughs> minute trial. And all I've done is mark the interval um, before and after each one. And this is just, just being out on a, on, a, on a training ride with a bit of recovery in between. But you can see we've got the ability to get the work, the power, and, and the time. So it really allows us to go out to the field and do some testing. Now, this time, the critical power is 273. Some research that we've, we've been doing is we've been trying to collect as much data as we can of the lab measurement, the same protocol but out on the road, and also using performances. And you can see the first two are fairly similar. But the one using the performance times is slightly lower. So when we um, look at, say, a lab measurement in the traditional critical power protocol, where I've done three trials at different percentages of my VO2 max, got set powers and you go for as long as you can, compared to being out in the field and doing those blocks of time of three, five or seven, 12 minutes. They're pretty similar, even though the target to the athlete is different. But using the performance data from races, we tend to get a lower critical power. And what we suspect, it's probably quite, quite obvious in a way that the, the longer the duration of the trials, <coughs> the critical power drops. So I'm using an hour's worth rather than uh, between two and 15 minutes. So it really does have an effect on how, which trials we use. That's why we tend to try and stick, um, try and tend to uh, stick to two to fifteen minutes so that we're, we're consistent. The bonus of using performance data is that we can track your progress without having to do those tests during the racing season. It's it's nice to, to be able to do that. What we set up on the um, on the PB Science website is an ability for you to go on there and compute your own critical power. So like I say, it's not a linear relationship, 
so you have to put in some curve fitting. So basically you would enter in your, um, your race time in minutes and seconds and the power that you held. And then when you press the calcula calculate button, um, after putting your body mass in there, you would get a critical power, the absolute critical power, but also your critical power according to your body mass. So it's a nice little calculator that you've got in there.